Hello and welcome back to Abstract Linear Algebra, the video course where we deepen our linear algebra knowledge. And indeed in today's part 34 we will define the abstract notion of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. There you might already know that eigenvalues and eigenvectors play an important role because they can simplify a complicated linear map. However, before we dive into the definition, I first want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. And please don't forget, by using the link in the description, you can download additional material like PDF versions, books and quizzes. In fact, I would say it's really helpful for learning if you have the written version of the video next to you. Very well, then let's immediately start with a picture of an eigenvector. So let's say this is a vector x in our vector space and now a linear map L acts on it. And there what we need is that the linear map L maps the vector space V into itself again. Because then under this assumption it could happen that x is mapped to itself. Or more generally we get a vector out that goes into the same direction as x. This means the image Lx lies in the span of x. This implies that the linear map is really simple for this given vector because it's just scaling and nothing more. So you see this is exactly the same idea as we have already discussed it for matrices in the linear algebra course. Therefore I think we don't need more motivation here and we can immediately go to the definition. Hence let's fix our general f vector space v and a general linear map we call L. Now important to note is that everything in the definition here will work for finite dimensional vector spaces but also for infinite dimensional spaces. This is simply because we don't need any matrix representation to define eigenvectors and eigenvalues. However, still as always, if we have a matrix representation it can definitely help for calculations. Okay, now the first thing you should remember is that an eigenvector can never be the zero vector in the vector space. This totally makes sense because the zero vector is always mapped to the zero vector again, so it always lies in the span of the zero vector. So it's not a special property for the zero vector, so we have to exclude it. However, for any other vector in V, it's quite surprising that the linear map is just given by scaling. Hence it means that we can find a scalar lambda in our field f. And this one should satisfy that the image Lx is given as lambda times x. So this is the standard equation for eigenvectors and eigenvalues where lambda is called the corresponding eigenvalue. To be precise we could say this is the eigenvalue of the linear map L associated to the eigenvector x. And here it's always important to point out that there is no restriction for the eigenvalue in the field. Any number in the field can be an eigenvalue of the linear map L including zero. However, as you might already know, for an n-dimensional vector space we will find at most n different eigenvalues. And indeed this finite dimensional case is the one we often deal in linear algebra with. But I think it's already good to know that this is the general definition for any vector space and any linear map. In all cases we can just work with this important equation and bring lambda times x to the left hand side. And then we just have the linear map L minus lambda times the identity map on the left hand side. And now we know if this kernel is bigger than just the zero vector then we have an eigenvector. And associated to this eigenvector we also have the eigenvalue which is lambda. So this is something you can remember, the information of all the eigenvalues of a linear map is always hidden in the operation kernel of L minus lambda identity. And moreover in this case we always have infinitely many possible eigenvectors to a given eigenvalue. Namely this whole kernel without the zero vector describes all the eigenvectors. Hence this is what we call the eigenspace of the linear map L associated to the eigenvalue lambda. So you see an eigenspace becomes a subspace of our vector space V if we add the zero vector to it. And moreover we already know how to calculate these kernels for the finite dimensional case. 
there we have the advantage that we can always choose a basis of V with N vectors in it. And then we know that the matrix representation of L minus lambda times the identity with respect to the basis B is given by the matrix representation of L minus lambda times the identity matrix. And there we can use the fact that the dimension of the kernel does not change if we go to the corresponding matrix representation. In other words, we get the following equivalence. The one kernel is non-trivial if and only if the other one is as well. However, here on the right hand side we know that this is the description of eigenvalues for matrices. This means if we go to the matrix representation, we don't change the eigenvalues at all. This is important to remember because we already know how to calculate eigenvalues for matrices. We just have to solve the corresponding characteristic polynomial which is given by a determinant. However, now we already know that the determinant is also defined in the abstract sense, so without any matrix representation. Therefore you see we have a lot of equivalences here and all describe the same thing, namely that lambda is an eigenvalue. However, you also see that for the common finite dimensional case, you just have to know how to calculate eigenvalues for square matrices, because then you can translate everything to the abstract case as well. For this reason, the actual motivation for this abstract case comes from the infinite dimensional case. Therefore, I would say, let's look at a quite simple example of that. So let's consider the so-called C1 functions on the real number line. For the definition of this vector space, we need a little bit more than just linear algebra knowledge. Namely, you need to know real analysis and continuously differentiable functions. This is actually what we have here. Every function f in the set is differentiable in such a way that the derivative is a continuous function again. And the short description of that is to say that f is continuously differentiable or just c1. And now you might know that we can just increase this number here, so we would say we are in C2 if the derivative is still continuously differentiable. And then if the second derivative is still continuously differentiable, we would say we are in C3. So in the end we can go to C infinity where all derivatives of f exist. And in words we would describe it as f is arbitrarily often continuously differentiable. So for example, all polynomials lie in this space for sure. And therefore we also already know that this is not a finite dimensional vector space. However, we already know a very nice linear operation on this vector space, namely the differentiation. This means we take such a function f and send it to its derivative. This is a nice general linear map and we already use that a lot while calculating with polynomials. However, if we have more than polynomials, we immediately find an eigenvector and an eigenvalue for this linear map. Indeed, you might know that the exponential function is its own derivative. So here you just have to know that the exponential function sends x to e to the power x. And there a little bit of analysis knowledge tells you that the derivative is e to the power x again. Now this means this exponential function works as a vector here and namely it's an eigenvector with respect to the eigenvalue 1. So we immediately know that our linear map L has an eigenvalue given by 1. So you see, even in this abstract setting of functions, we have something we can call eigenvectors and eigenvalues. And there I should tell you that sometimes people call this eigenvector eigenfunction simply because we work in a space of functions. However, it turns out it's not so easy to find all eigenvalues and all eigenvectors in an infinite dimensional example. Therefore, this is something I discuss in my other video course called Functional Analysis. Indeed, there we always work with infinite dimensional cases, where in linear algebra we often have a finite dimensional case. Therefore, here in our abstract linear algebra course, I want to calculate more with the matrix representations. And this is exactly what we will do in the next videos. So I really hope I meet you there and have a nice day. Bye bye.